right, good morning. Did everyone feel like you got cheated out an hour of sleep? Yeah. Here's the thing that I, I don't like about the spring forward and fall back stuff is I, I get up at 2 in the morning to set the clock forward, and then I have a difficult time falling back asleep. So I've been up since 2 this morning. And so I'm thinking, why doesn't the politicians, which is probably a whole different message, but why doesn't the politicians just say, hey, you could turn the clock back at 9 o'clock and it would be good. So anyway, I'm a little bit bitter, and I hope you guys will help me out, right? I'm the leader. Welcome. Y'all are following me. You're in good hands. All right, just kidding. Um, inside your program is an outline. I want to encourage you guys to follow along today as we are in part two of Jesus Is. For those of you who are Bible wonks, um, this is kind of like uh, Christology. So those of you, so it's kind of the idea of systematic theology as we look at five weeks of honing in and learning more about Christ and his character and who he is. All right, so today we're going to look at Jesus Is the Point. How many of you, we're going to have a little confession time. How many of you have a difficult time paying attention? Go ahead and raise your hand if that's, if that's you. All right. How many of you, you, you missed what I said because you weren't paying attention? How many of you did that? All right. That's better. Uh, how many of you have already lost track of where we are in the service? Go ahead and raise your hand. Hey, Eric, come on out. We need help. All right. And so here we're going to do, we're going to watch a video and we're going we're gonna to have a little test on your awareness. Take a watch. This is an awareness test. How many times does the team in white pass the ball? answered 13 passes, you are correct. But did you see the moonwalking gorilla? Uh, you guys, is there, there's something cleansing about owning it, right? How many of you missed it? Go ahead, raise your hand. All right. So about three quarters of the first service did. And uh, so anyway, you guys are a little bit sharper than the other ones. How many of you did even, did you, you miss the video? Anybody just missed the video completely? The lights went out, you took a nap, right? You're like... So, so, so it's kind of funny, isn't it? You kind of watch that, and then the second time you're like, how did I miss that the first time? And, and we, you know, we have a good time with it, and it's all good. And I guess here's kind of the big picture of today. If it's a video and you miss the moonwalking gorilla, it doesn't impact your life. But what if you miss the point of life? Well, what, if, what if in the midst of watching all the guys throw the balls and try to count, well, one, two, is that... At three, you know, all that. Well, what if in all the activity of life, you miss the point of life? I mean, how would that affect you? And how frustrating would it be when you step and you look back and you realize that all the activity and all the and who caught the ball and tossed it back and all that stuff, you miss the point of life. See, all of a sudden, it impacts you in a huge way. Right? Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to, uh, after we get there, we're going to look at a couple Old Testament passages just to kind of set the context. But I, I want to read to you something that Jesus says. And what he's going to say to the people that he's speaking to in that first century, it's just completely different. They, they had never, they, they don't even know at this point what he's even talking about. And you'll see a visual of it in a few moments uh, of how it is in life. And so here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. You got your outlines ready. Here we go. It says, come to me, all you who are what? And, and I will give you, which is weird. 
right? Because when you think about your relationship with Christ, you, you think about going to him for prayer. You think about going him, to him for wisdom. You think about going to him for you know, somebody else that you're praying for. You're frustrated. You don't know how. You, you think of going to him for lots of things, but rest? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't know when I feel overwhelmed in life. I don't know if I go, you know, I got to go to Jesus. Usually what I do is I ask God to bless whatever I'm doing so I can keep doing it, right? And so Jesus calls to these folks. He says, come to me. It's an invitation. Come to me, you who are weary, burdened, and I will give you rest, all right? Now, in God's rhythm, all the way back into Genesis, there is this idea of rest in there, right? And, and so just to look at a couple passages and set up the context, Genesis 2, verse 2, it says this, um, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing, and on the seventh day, he added one more thing to do. No? He, he looked and he said, I got free time, I know, let's load up some more stuff on our calendar. What did he do? Right. Rest is the rhythm that God has created. Right? And remember, in Genesis, we're created in his image. We're not God, but we're created in his image. There's a spiritual element to our life. And so we are to follow and be, cautious, uh, be aware of how he's created this rhythm in, in our life. Right, and, and so in your outline, the word Sabbath, it means to stop. Right? And we're going to talk about what Sabbath is because most of us believe this, that Sabbath means, or to quote stop means, it means to stop from all the other activities so that we can do all the things that we haven't started yet. It's, it's the to-do list that got pushed aside and now we need to go and do it. Right? And that's, what, that's how we view a Sabbath. A Sabbath is stop from the crazy activities so we can go over to this calendar and we can finish up those activities. And that's, and that's how we kind of live our life. Now, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 14, it says this, observe the Sabbath. And then if you skip over a couple of verses to verse 17, it says, uh, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, what did he do? Rested and was and you can circle the word refresh there, all right? But because in that idea where you have the idea of refreshed, most of the time in the Old Testament, in, in the Hebrew, it's, it's a noun, right? And so that's primarily what it's listed as. But there are three occasions in the Old Testament where it's a verb. And every single time, it's connected to the Sabbath, Right? And, and, and so in your outline, the idea of refreshed has this meaning. It's talking about your soul, the inside of you, and it means to be resold or it means to be put back together. You ever have a pair of shoes that you really like and you wore out the bottoms and so you take it to the shoe repair person and they put a new soul on it? They breathe new life into those old shoes because maybe they're expensive, they're comfortable, whatever the case is, but you feel like they need to have new life in them so you have them resold. So it is in our life, right? The idea of a stop isn't to finish all the things that we haven't done the idea is to stop is, as God build, builds us rest in, in this rhythm that he has, is to be resold, that your soul gets replenished in life. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So here's what God knows about us. And let's see if you think that it's the same for, uh, for you as it is me. <clears throat> we wake up to something that's called an uh, clock, right? Isn't that great? They don't call it a soothing clock. They don't call it a whispering clock. They call it an alarm clock, right? And welcome to morning or afternoon or however your sleep pattern is. I remember my dad, when I was a kid, he had the old school wind-up ones. Anybody remember that? And you could, I could hear, we didn't have a big home, but I could hear click, 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 right? Every single night as I'm sleeping in, 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 my, in my room, click, click, and then the, the alarm. Was it awesome or what? Like that, you know, and it's, oh, we're up, we're ready. Well, the alarm just went off, we're ready to go. And so what do you do if your world is anything like mine, and I know some of you think I work for like 
80 minutes a week and I say the same thing twice and it's because I screw up on the first service so I try to bail it out in the second service, right? And I know you guys think, you, you guys laugh, but you actually believe that. And so, <clears throat> so what do you do? You wake up and here's my prayer on Monday morning and it happens every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And Friday is kind of my sabbatical and it's like, Lord, just, I want you to just anoint my day and here's how I have it. And I want to study for 15, and then I want to pray, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to do all these things. And I have this whole agenda. And here's the great thing about my God. He just fits into my agenda perfectly. <laughs> then the phone rings. Someone knocks on the door. And my cell phone goes off. And my day is upside down, right? Things have happened in the lives of folks. Things have happened in my own life. And it's, it's just a crazy day. Right? So then I work through it and I figure, okay, whew, I'm going to just go home. I'm going to kick back on the couch. I'm going to watch a little TV, eat some grapes, relax a little bit. And you walk in, right? And I know your house isn't possessed like my house is. <clears throat> but there's a plumbing problem. The breaker just went off. Something happened in this. The swimming pool looks like a science project, <laughs> right? And, and there's a cat that we don't even know, and it is possessed because all cats are possessed. And, <clears throat> and so it drugs something in the backyard, and there's, right? And it's just one thing after the other thing after the other thing. And you're like, Lord, just deliver me from Monday. Tuesday is going to be glorious. <laughs> and Tuesday does the same thing, Right? And then, and then you think you get a minute of just like a little bit of glory in heaven. This is what it's going to look like. And for, for whatever reason, God just pulls it out from under you. It's like, no, I want you to drive to Walnut Creek during commute time, right? 16 miles. It'll take you four hours and 15 minutes, <laughs> right? And I know you got two in a crowd or whatever that is, and you drive in the diamond lane. I drive on the infield, which is like a different driving lane than where you guys normally drive, right? And it takes forever, right? And then you're just like, Lord, just give me one day on Wednesday. Just let me wake up and let me just experience your presence. Can anything go right on Wednesday? And it's like, oh, Lord, right? And it goes nuts. Anybody? Or is it just, just my world, Right? So pray for Pastor Dan, because I'm the sickest guy in this room, right? <clears throat> so here's what God knows about us. Number one in your outline is that we tend to crowd out the margins in our life. Now, whether it's we caused it or whether it's just the broken world in which we live in, you know, whatever it is, but for whatever reason it is, we just get dumped into this area where there's no margins on the side, there's no breathing room, there isn't anything. And so Jesus speaks into this environment. In the environment that he spoke into, it wasn't so much about activities from all the day-to-day -day stuff as it was religious activities. The religious leaders had taken like the Ten Commandments and they had piled a bunch of stuff into it. And here's the thing. They all had good intentions. It wasn't that they hated people. They wanted their life to be blessed. They wanted them to experience God in a greater way. And so they took 10 and they made it hundreds. And the people felt overwhelmed. They felt like they couldn't get a break. They couldn't get any breathing room in life. And every time they finished something, then there was one more thing, one more regulation, one more pro policy, one more time they had to go and present something. It was always something. And they felt like, we just can't get any wiggle room in life. We can't get any breathing room. And so Jesus comes and he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And you look in your outline, there's a couple words there, we'll get some definition. The word weary is this, and see if you ever feel this way. It carries the idea of working to the point of utter exhaustion. You ever feel that way? Right? It's just always something. And, and here's what's interesting. This is what I learned from, from folks, that, that when, even when people get ready to retire or they're retired, you know, they're, they're thinking, it's like, oh, we're going to sail into the golden years and it's all going to be easy, and, and it isn't. Right? And I've heard this a hundred times from folks who retired. They just shift their activities from the work stuff. Now they just shift it into their own life or their kid's life or their grandkid's life, the neighbor down the street, and they need something. And, and they got all these things. And the activities hasn't stopped. It's just shifted a little bit. But their life is still overwhelming. 
right? And so whether you're retired or whether you're, you know, a, 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 single, a, a single person or a stay-at-home mom, it just seems like in our world in which we live in, there, there's this point where we just feel like, can we just have a minute of solitude? Can we? Second one is this, burdened. And this is the idea that there's something in your life, maybe from the past or whatever, but there's this great load that was dumped on, on, on you, right? I mean, you could almost, come on, be honest, there, there, there was, there's this, almost like this, you can hear the backup beepers on the dump truck as it's getting ready to dump on you. You know, beep, 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 right? And you're just sitting there going, oh, no, here it goes, whoosh. Right? And we end up filling up our life. So let me give you a visual of what that looks like. <clears throat> the first picture that I want to have you up on the board, this is, this is in Old Testament. This is in Hebrew. Um, you have no idea what it means, so I'm just going to make it up. This is the Ten Commandments, because you don't know, because you can't see it, A, and you don't know Hebrew, too, so it doesn't matter. But the first line says, Dan is a genius. The second line is, no. So, so let's just imagine that's the Ten Commandments, all right? Now, now, when you look at that from an optic standpoint, you look at that, you go, I could do that, right? I mean, that looks like that's doable, so here's what the religious leaders did, and here is Jesus. Now think about what he's saying. He's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And here's what the culture did, the religious leaders did to those people. Here's the next slide. That's it. Now all of a sudden you look at that and be honest. You want to take a nap, <laughs> Right? I mean, it's, it's, like a government, it's like a government form that never ends. If you check this box, then you got to do that. And if you check that box, then you got to go to page nine. You can check this box. And if you don't check that box, you need to explain why you didn't check that box, right? And you just want to say, you know what? I don't even care. If they owe me money, they can keep it. Right? Am I, is it, is it right? You just feel overwhelmed with that. And so Jesus speaks into the life of these people and, and just to visualize what he's saying. All you who are weary and burdened. Because when you look at that, you feel like someone just dumped a dump truck on you. And he says, I will give you rest. Right? I, I, I will bring peace into your life that you haven't experienced. Because he recognizes that all of us have humans, because we all have a sinful nature, is to constantly be pushed push, push, push. And for us in our culture, it isn't law. It isn't like the Old, it isn't like the old Testament uh, uh, legal people giving more burdens and regulations on the people. You know what it is for us? Activities, isn't it? And, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden you got this thing. And then, well, if you do that, I mean, you might as well do that too. I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, that's Tuesday and Thursday. What's Monday and Friday? What's the big deal on that? So then we just sign up to that. And then, and then someone else says, well, if you're going to do that, you know, you really need to do is over here, too, because this is, this is really good. And then your neighbor says, hey, you ought to try. I mean, after all. Now, remember, the religious leaders weren't doing it out of anger and hate for the people. They had good intentions. And how many of the things that we have in our life that we fill out and do and do and do, we have good intentions. But it just keeps adding into our life, doesn't it? And those good intentions oftentimes come back to bite us, don't they? Because all of a sudden, we're worrying about all the balls that are being tossed in the air and how many, how many uh, uh, times a kid, uh, someone catches it, and we miss the point, which is Jesus, moonwalking in front of us. Because we have all this activity that's going on, right? And, and I've heard this a gazillion times, it's like, you hear, you hear folks who are struggling in relationships, and then you start peeling back the layers of why they're struggling. Well, you know, the kids want to, and you know, we signed up, and I thought, what's the big deal? We're just going to go down to this exercise class or this, and I got a hobby. You know what I'm doing now? I'm, you know, whatever it is. You could fill in the blanks, and all of them are fine. But you know what they do? They take our life, and it works all the way to the edges, and there is no margin. 
And so when we wake up on Monday, it's like we're storming, going crazy, and then Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then Thursday, and then Friday. And then we often think, and this is why we've all been to it, we often think that the Sabbath, the sabbatical, is to catch up on all the things we haven't had time to do. And it's never meant to that, for that. The Sabbath was always to realign our focus to Jesus to be the point, right? But we get all caught up in all the other things that need to happen because we get, we get overwhelmed. Number two in your outline. This is where Jesus not only invites us to come to him to find rest, but he goes on to say something interesting. He says this in verse 29. He says, take, and what's the next word? Take, take my yoke. Right? In, in other words, and again, you got you to recognize this. Here's how we typically do it. We say, Jesus, here's my yoke. Here's my calendar. Here's my activities. Here's my life. Now what I want you to do is I want you to bless my yoke. And he says, that's not the way that it is. I don't want to remove the responsibilities from your life. I just simply want you to take your yoke off that is burdened, that is weighing you down, take it off to find mine or to place mine on yours, right? But that, that isn't how we live our life. We, we ask, I mean, think of your prayer life. God bless this, God bless this, God heal them, God touch them, right? Right? We're, we're doing that, and in the meantime, we're inviting him to be a part. It's almost like, and as crazy as it sounds, we're saying, Lord, this is my yoke. Just join me. And he's like, I'm the lead dog. Right? I'm the point. I'm the reason why you're here. Right? And I want to invite you in to be a part of it. So he says, take my yoke <clears throat> upon you. And then he says, and, and then what's the next word? Learn from me, right? And, that, and that's the same word that we would get disciple from or discipleship from. And, and so it isn't the idea, and whenever we, the idea of discipleship, it's always submission. It isn't that we're telling Jesus, now you follow me and you just be right behind me, so stay close and you can hold my belt buckle in the back so you don't get lost because here I go into my world and I want you to just kind of, you know, bless it, lift your hands, shake some pixie dust on me and just make it work good for me because you ready, Jesus? Here we go, right? And we launch in. He's like, no, 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 that isn't how it works. A disciple means that you're following him. It's kind of like on-the-job training, some of you who do training, you know, there's a simple three-step process. You say to the person, the apprentice, okay, I want you to watch me. And you do it. And then there's a moment where you say, okay, now let's do it together. Right? And then the third phase is, okay, now as the master, you're the apprentice, I'm going to watch you do it. Well, oftentimes we get to the, sec the, th the second part and the third part, and really we need to camp out as disciples in the first part, which is simply this. We need to watch Jesus do it. And the truth is, and we know this in our heart, that when he leads us into that area, that's where the blessings are. But too often we ask him to bless what we're doing in our life. And so he says, learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. In other words, I'm not like the religious leaders that just dumped all kinds of activities and, and regulations on you. And then here's the promise. When you take his yoke, when you learn from him, you will find rest for your soul. Right? There's a sense of, whew, he's got it. I can rest in him. And the verse goes on in verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Y'all know what a yoke is, right? So there's a picture just in case you don't. We're a bunch of city dwellers, so we don't, we don't know that. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we, we try to look to find a yoke, and um, most uh, folks in this area, because we don't have like Amish people living around here, most people have tractors. <laughs> they don't have like ox pulling the thing. So we have harnesses. When the harness is where it saddles the, the, the horsepower, cow power, whatever it is it's pulling on that one animal. A yoke is different. A yoke is that it halves the load. And so even though you have one that may be a little bit inferior, the other, the stronger one, pulls 
both, right? And that is the visual of Christ. He's the leader, right? He's pulling, he's leading, and we're simply following along with him as we're disciples, as we follow along with him as we begin to move forward. So in your outline, he offers us a better way to live, a way where we take his yoke, right? And in order to do that, we have to discard our own. So it isn't the idea that he's not going to give us responsibilities. We are going to have responsibilities. You still have to do life. The problem is you're doing it on your own. You're caught up in all the, jo- the balls being ju- uh, juggled in the air, and how many is that? 5, 6, 12, 13, 14, was that 14 or 15? I don't know. No, I think it's 13, and right? And then there's the monkey going through. I can't moonwalk. I used to be able to, but I don't have the moves anymore. You know what I'm saying? And so we miss the point of life, and we miss the reason. Y'all with me? Yeah. Number three, and here we get down to home. Jesus is the point. Instead of merely offering a mandate or an ideal or a philosophy, he offers himself, right? And and this becomes the important part of recognizing it. This becomes the important part where we begin to see it for what it is. Now, I am a great husband, right? So let's hear it for Pastor Dan. (laughs) I know some of you guys said last week because I... Showed my uh, high school picture from last, uh, last week and on, on, the, on the thing. And most of you stood up and said, man, that guy's a hottie, right? And all that stuff. And it's embarrassing when I hear that stuff. <clears throat> and so, and then, I, and then I showed a picture of my wife her, in her side. I think it was her sophomore year doing it. And some, some of you wrote on the card, I'm surprised you're still alive. So anyhow, I don't know what that means. But anyway, we, we did it and it, it's all fun. But one of the things that I'll do is uh, I, Tammy watches those shows on decorating, you know what I'm talking about, like ESPN and Sports Center and stuff like that? Oh, no. So it's like HGTV or something. It's way above my pay grade. I don't understand what they're doing there. It looks like work to me, and I get tired watching them. And so, the, you know, the decorators, and they're painting, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're talking about a focal point, right? Well, when you walk into the room, you know, that fireplace or that mantle or that whatever it is the focal point in in our house it's a big picture of me so that's like that's the focal point when we walk in it's like that guy's handsome but it's it's airbrushed it's all fine I'm much taller thinner way smarter and so anyhow um, so you walk in and there's a focal point Right? And then you listen to this lady who knows about decorating, and she talks about that all the accessories around the focal point all fit in, but the focal point is the point, right? That when everyone walks in the room, they walk in and they're like, wow, there it is. See, that's what Jesus is to be for us. And here's our problem our life is like my decorating. There's knickknacks, there's stuff, there's pictures. It makes no, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, it's all good stuff. My grandma gave it, my dad gave it, my mom gave it, someone gave it, I found it in a dumpster. And I just have it all over the place, right? And you walk in and you're like, what's the point? And that is our problem, isn't it? See, we don't have knickknacks, we have activities, don't we? And someone says, hey, you ought to. And it's like, yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, two nights a week, that's nothing. Hey, you know what you should do? The kids go, dad, you know, my my friend's doing, here we go. And the next door neighbor says, have you ever? There we go. And we start putting in all these things. And you know what gets crowded out? The focal point. And you walk into life, and there's just all this stuff. It isn't bad stuff. In some cases, it's really good stuff. But it ends up crowding out the point of life. As I shared in the first service, it's not a part of the notes. I just felt God laying it on my heart. So in premarital counseling, that's where you get couples who want to go have we do 13 weeks of premarital counseling before we do a wedding and so you know they sit and I wish I had chairs up here but I I do this and those of you who sit in my counseling you, you know what it's like they sit and there's two chairs and they're always so cute and they're holding hands right 
And there's always, because one of my first questions is, is like, so why are you getting married, right? Here it is. Pastor Dan, I love him. <laughs> right? Y'all with me on that? And I'm like, I have no sense of humor or anything. I mean, everything's always serious. I'm like, don't worry, honey, you'll get over that. And so <laughs> everything will change. Trust me, everything will change. <laughs> Looks, the feelings, all that. Just don't go to the bank on that. Just kind of put it to the side, right? And then, and then here's, here's what happens. That's premarital counseling. And then I try to discourage them from getting married for the next 13 weeks. And that... <laughs> It's true. And then, and then postmarital counseling is when there's a marriage that's going through trouble. And this has happened a gazillion and five times, right? You, you listen to them. They tell their story. And you go, let me, let me share with you what's happened to you, right? There was a day where y'all were sitting next to each other. And there was a day where one of you looked and said to the pastor, but I love him. She is so... When I'm with her, I mean, my heart. Can, can you feel it? Look, right? And here's what happens. All of a sudden, you have two people right next to each other holding hands, and then a child is born. And the wife or husband steps one step over, right? Then they get a dog. So, it's a big dog. <laughs> it likes the house. <laughs> and there's more space. And then he got a promotion, and now he's on salary. So there's a little bit more space. And she, she was staying home, but she wants to work part-time, right? And, and so she's working five hours a couple days a week, and there's another step, Right? And then there's a moment where maybe there's another kid because you haven't figured out what the cause is. You need to get well water and all that stuff. Everything will be fine. Bottle water it fixes everything. And so all of a sudden, when, when you, look at, you look across, there's a chasm. And it isn't bad. It's a kid. It's a dog. It's a job. It's a promotion. It's a bigger home. It's a boat. I mean, it's hobbies. It isn't bad. And the person looks... And this is true. This is, God is my witness. I've heard this a, a gazillion times. When I meet with them privately, she's a great wife. She's a wonderful mother. He's a wonderful guy. He's great with the kids. But do you know an attorney? And I stop and I think, well, what are you looking for? You like, you want something like bad? Oh, she's way good. He's way good. I want something horrible, right? No, that isn't. But you know what's happened? Life has intervened in the chasm in between. And where they were not prioritizing each other, life happened. It isn't bad. It's just life has happened. And they've drifted. It's called marital drift. They've drifted, right? And when you begin to peel away the onion and you say, well, what's in this gap? Well, you know, the kids like and the kids are involved and they got in and I signed up and I said, and it's three nights a week and what's the big deal? And then he said a dog and it's a service dog and I have to go and then, right? And it's a cat and you know cats, and, right? <laughs> and there's all, the, all this stuff that goes on, right? And it creates a chasm. And the problem is, that our focal point has changed. You know, you've heard me say this a hundred times. God is first. If you're married, your marriage is second. Your kids are third. And I don't even want to mention the job because most of you are workaholics and you struggle with that anyway. And your job is fourth. And if you don't prioritize those three, and uh, wives and husbands, not your kids first, God is first, your spouse is second. The best thing that you can give your kids is a wonderful marriage, right? Not stuff and things. But if we don't, what ends up happening is we fill our whole life up with stuff. And we miss the point. 
And then as a result, it overwhelms us and it creates problems and relationships and everything else in our life, right? And then when you step back, it's like, well, it isn't anything bad, but it's just the wrong stuff you're looking at, right? The, the wrong things that are filling up your life. And, and I think that when we look at Scripture, I think God knew that that was part of our problem, that we were more inclined to fill our lives up with stuff and miss the point of life. So in your outline, when Jesus says, come to me, we in three, right? He's not saying, I will teach you about rest or I will point you in the right direction. He offers it because he is the rest, right? Which is the idea of what four is in your outline is that Jesus is the point. And when we orient our, our life in every area of our life around him, life works. Now pay attention. It doesn't mean everything is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that it's always downhill and the wind's to, against our back and we're just getting pushed everywhere and life is easy. We live in a broken world. Broken things throw broken things at people. Hello, right? And so all it simply means is, is that when you're living in a broken world, that he is going to be the lead and he is going to empower you in your life. That he has to be the point of your life. Otherwise, you're just going to simply fill it up and you're going to count how many balls and you're going to walk in and your room's going to look like I don't know what. And someone's going to go, what are they trying to do in here? And you're going to go, I don't know, but there's like stuff every. I mean, it's cool stuff, but it's just stuff everywhere. But it isn't helping your relationship with God. It isn't helping your relationship with your spouse. It isn't helping your relationship with your kids. It's just all stuff. And then as a result, it begins to wear on you. And so Jesus says, and back to verse uh, 27, which is the verse before 28, right? And I held that back from you because I wanted you to see the importance of what he's inviting us to. So in verse 28, he says, all you who are weary and burdened, come to me and I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke. It's easy. But here is the context of what he's inviting us into. Look what he says in verse 27. He says, what's the first word? All. all. Now, th those of you who are Greek scholars, you know. What is the, what is the meaning of all in the Greek? All. all of it, right? She's a scholar right here. It means all of it, right? So, so look what he says. All things have been committed to me by my Father. For those of the folks who struggle with the, the idea of Trinity, this is one of the verses that is really a proof text uh, to that. Now, now, think about how crazy this is. What do we do? We say, Jesus, bless what I'm doing, and here's the things that I'm going to do. I want you to pay attention because you don't have a smartphone, and I know you're like old school, so here it is on the calendar. Look at one, I want to do this. Two, I want to do this. Three, I want you paying attention. All right, count... Come on, stay with me, Jesus, right? And I want you to bless it. And Jesus says, you're missing it. You're missing the point. Everything has been given to him. Why would you ask an amateur to help you when you could ask the creator of the profession? I mean, how silly is that? I mean, that's like going to, if you, if you pick a, a, a study, right, and, and it's like the guru of it, and you say to the first, uh, the person who's a first semester, whatever, you know, excuse me, I want to pick your brain. Oh, no, professor, listen, I don't have time for you. I want to listen to what this person says here. They don't even own the book. That dude wrote the book, and we do that in life, don't we? We ask him to bless what we're doing, and Jesus is saying, you got it backward. You need to say, okay, Jesus, where are you? I'm following you, right? I'm a disciple of you. I'm submitting to the direction in which you're leading. And as a result of it, my life will be richly enhanced. So in that outline, Jesus, in verse 27, he establishes who he is. And so he says, basically, that he is equal with God. Right? As he calls him the father, my father. 
And then in your outline just below that, his deity, right, and Jesus' deity, Jesus has received all things, all authority, all sovereignty, all truth, and all power has been given to him. And we're saying, I got it. How crazy is that? And then we feel like, Lord, I just need, a, can I just have like a minute of sanity? Just, just, just give me like, just, I'll just take a half a second. How crazy is that? And he invites us to come in to be a part of it. If you think through the miracles of Jesus, Jesus didn't commit miracles for miracle's sake. In fact, all the miracles that he, co- that he committed only were for a time, right? Is the guy that was healed of blind, is he still around? Have you seen him lately walking the streets anywhere? No. There was a point he was healed, he lived, he died. The point of miracles were simply to point to him that he has the sovereignty and power to do so, right? He has the power over illness, disease, demons, nature, life, death, sin, right? And that's why he committed, uh, that's why he did all those miracles. You all with me? So here's some practical takeaways. <clears throat> three, le- three words with all S. The first one is stop. Have the confidence to be able to stop doing the things that are not pushing you in the direction of your relationship with Jesus. If you're married, your relationship with your spouse. If you have children, your relationship with your kids. Stop it. Doing all the activities isn't going to make you any better. In fact, let me just say this. Sometimes our activities ruin our relationship. So stop. Have the confidence to just step back and ask, if I do, if I sign up, if our kids are involved, if I'm involved, is this moving the ball forward? Is it helping my focus on Jesus? Number two, sleep, and I don't mean during the sermon. That's a given. Some of you email me on a regular basis. It's the best hour sleep I've had all week, so I appreciate that. Thanks for the words of encouragement, right? And, And that's simply this, that oftentimes the most spiritual thing we can do is take a nap, right? Spurgeon talked about that. Spurgeon talked about rest, that that it actually improves your life and your productivity, not by doing more, but by doing less, right? And then the last one is the sabbatical. And remember what the, the, or Sabbath rather, remember that the idea of of the Sabbath is to stop. It isn't to do all the other home projects that you didn't have time to do. The Sabbath is the idea of taking your focus of everything else and bringing it back to Christ. Sunday is, for us, a Sabbath. And when I sit down to, to talk about and to, to write a message, here, it's, it's simplistic. Here it is. Ready? I mean, this is kind of where I start with my mind. <laughs> Jesus is first. Now so let's start writing. Because at the end of the day, if I can get your attention back to Jesus being first, that is a win for speaking right? And that's what a Sabbath is. And so you see the danger. If you fill your life up with all kinds of other, well, you know, we want to go on this and the, the, the snow and we got to go skiing and the boats and the gun. I got to plant this and I got to do that. And I forgot to build. I got to do a gazebo, right? You do all these things. What's it doing? It's not bringing your focus to Jesus. It's adding one more thing to what your vision sees in life. Right? And so it's just getting squeezed. Your, your vision of Jesus is, being, is, is basically being squeezed out. Right? And, and so, again, just wrap it up, close here. In Colossians, it says this. And, and, and again, as believers, this is incredible. That with a single spoken word, all the galaxies spin and move perfectly in alignment. That when you look into space and you see how everything moves perfectly, and as the sun's closer and there's summer and it's farther away, you know, you get get winter and fall and so forth, and it's just perfect, and we know with some sense of confidence that tomorrow's going to roll around, there's going to be a sunset and a sunrise, and they can predict what time the sunset is, and they can predict what time the sunrise is going to be. 
and day after day after day, and they can prove five years from now, this is what's going to happen. And here's why. Because Jesus, who invited you in to yoke up with him, is the one in Colossians that says, he spoke it into existence, and everything is held with a single word. So let me just throw this back to you, and we're going to pray. Why on earth would you want to do life on your own? When you can pair up, team up, yoke up with the one who is holding it with a single word. How crazy is that? And yet we do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for in your love and your grace. Thank you for this opportunity to gather. And Lord, my prayer is simple, that as we leave here today, Jesus, you would be first in our life, that we would see you clearly number one in every area of our life. And Lord, as we leave here, may your spirit give us the boldness to peel away the things that get so, um, that kind of trap us and fill our lives up with stuff. God, help us to have that confidence just to peel it away. And Lord, we give you praise in advance. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ, and I want to give you that opportunity <clears throat> before we leave here, and that is to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to, to make him number one in your life. And we just do a little ABC. It's not a formula. It's just a way we kind of keep track. And A is admit that we're sinners. Every single one of us, have, we have all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, and C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and you've never invited Christ to be your Lord and Savior, as I say this prayer, just silently repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have completely missed the mark. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again. And today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me a brand new start. Thank you for making me a new creation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God